Nicholas, I am thrilled to have you on 20 Minute Playbook. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Always a fun time. (laughs) That's right. Always a fun time. Second time on. Second time on. Hope to make it three at some point next year. Um, Let's jump right into the questions. I'd love to start by asking about a recent fascination. What have you been obsessed with, fascinated by recently? What can't you stop thinking about? I'm going to do a a quick shameless plug, but it's the honest answer, which is um, I co-started a software company about a year ago called TypeShare, which is all focused on giving writers templates to use to start writing online. And it was a really basic idea. At first, we were like, okay, you know, I think we can help reduce some friction by creating these templates for people. And basically what's happened is over the past 12 months now, I cannot stop seeing templates everywhere. I, I now firmly believe that every single piece of writing ever created can be reverse engineered into a template. And in order to do that, you have to really understand all the little pieces. Like obviously I've been writing for a long time, you know, in order to understand how templates get assembled, there's a lot of working knowledge that goes into it. But now I just can't stop. And everything I read and everything I pick up and everything I look at, every headline, every Twitter thread, every everything, all my brain's doing is just reverse engineering. What would that look like in the form of a template? So that's my current obsession and fascination. That's fascinating. Is the idea there, you know, you're thinking about that because you're thinking about adding more templates to TypeShare, or is it just a new way that you're seeing the world and it's kind of changing how you you think about creativity? Well, it's both. I mean, I I really want to provide more writers with templates so that more people feel comfortable starting to write. You know, looking at a blank page is probably one of the most terrifying things for most people. But more importantly, what it's changing about my own writing process is instead of sitting down and taking the, I'm just going to let the creativity magically come out of my fingertips approach, it makes me realize how much faster you can produce quality when you understand which quote unquote template you're using. You know, so like recently I went through and took a James Patterson mystery novel and reverse engineered the whole thing into a template. And I did it in like an hour, you know, and, and it made me realize oh, wow, like this, if you really understand what you're looking at, this whole thing is built like a Jenga tower. And if you get how the pieces click together, then when you sit down, you're not asking yourself, oh, what's this next magical idea that just appears? You just go, oh, well, this is the section where I say this type of thing. So what's that? And all the speed to idea is just like exponentially faster. It's really cool. Yeah, to make a parallel, uh, you know, so my background's in design. One of the things that you learn if you do kind of front end visual design is there's really two levels that you need to do great design work on. One is structural, that's typically called, you know, UX. Uh, and that will be, it, it's largely sometimes somebody thinking in terms of wireframes, which is actually very similar. It's a template, it's literally just boxes and squares and how it will be laid out in the hierarchy. And then there's the visual design once you have that. And, you know, the, the thing that sparked in my mind is as a designer, if you don't have the structure figured out and you're trying to execute, you actually have to bounce between what am I saying and how do I do it? And how do I, you know, does this look nice? Is this the right way to do it? But then at the same time, you're like, is this the right place on the page? So, you know, it makes a lot of sense to just separate those two things. There's the, you know, kind of execution and expression from the structure and the logic. So it seems like the template is the structure and the logic. Okay. <laughs> yes. You just vocalized that so much better, better than I did. But yes, I forgot that your whole background was in design because the idea for this came from Canva, right? So Canva completely removed the barrier to entry for all of these people. And now, you know, I don't have a design. I I couldn't design a box. You know what I mean? I struggle. That is not a skill set I have. But even I can go on to Canva. Why? Because they removed the barrier to entry of needing to know all of these advanced skills, right? So the more that I've taught writing and I continue to mentor other writers, I was just like, okay, well, it's the same thing right? If you're a writer and you give someone a blank page, they're not going to know what to do with that. You need to give them some sort of shell to color in. And now that I've unearthed this, you know, rabbit hole, it's like, I can't turn it off. It's everywhere. Is this your next book? (laughs) It's going to be a book. It's going to be a course. It's going to be, it's going to be a zillion. I mean, I really believe, you know, I went to school for fiction writing and I think about, you know, I valued my college experience. It taught me some things, but like, I look back at that and go, if someone had given me 50 templates 
when I was 19 years old, how different would my trajectory have been? And instead, me, like a lot of writers, you you figure that out on your own. You're like, all right, well, I'm going to create. Most writers don't even realize this, but when they sit down to write, they already have templates in their head, right? Because they've been doing a certain thing for so long. So they go, oh, okay, well, now this is where I say this. This is where I organize it this way. So it's already happening intuitively. It's just my realization is for the vast majority of people who are trying to start, you don't have that tool set yet. So how do you accelerate that? Well, you just go give them 50 templates and now they have it. It's Canva for writers. I love, love, love the idea. One of the, you know, obviously you've written many, many books. So I'm going to try to ask you to recommend books without recommending your own books in a second. But one of the things I love to ask guests about is for their favorite books. And I think for you, it would be interesting, I, I think, if you could share any writing books or just writers that you especially enjoy reading or anything that's helped you as a writer. And then separately, you obviously are an entrepreneur in many, many, many regards. So just anything that's been helpful for you on the business side. So I have some creative answers here. So the first is, I guess it depends on what genre. Um, I have this, I have it here in my office. So one of the most legendary uh, sales copywriters ever, his name's Gary Halbert. And like a couple years ago, I was scouring the web because a mentor of mine had told me, you got to go back through and read all of Gary Halbert's sales letters. And I found, I think his site or this site is owned by his family now, like the family estate. I guess. And what they did is they assembled, he had this direct response copywriting newsletter by mail. You know, he would mail it to people and they took all of the letters and they assembled them into the, this is one of two massive three ring binders with like hundreds of these letters in there. And it is, I, the only way I can describe it is Gary Halbert is what would have happened if Hemingway had discovered business. He writes the same way that Heming Hemingway writes in a very terse, minimalist sort of way, but it's all geared around how to get people to buy stuff. It's really, really fascinating. And I've, I've probably learned more from these reading all these old marketing letters than like anything. So that's my first recommendation. My second is if you haven't read Portnoy's Complaint by Philip Roth, that was one of the most transformative books for me. It's just, I don't even know how to describe it. It's hilarious, but it's extremely well-written and smart. It's fictional, but you know, he was Jewish. And so it was about, it was, you know, pseudo memoir of growing up in a Jewish household, overbearing mother, you know, strict, but aloof father. And that tone, the tone that that book is written in, I think is one of the most eloquently and perfectly sculpted sarcastic but smart tones I've ever found in literature. And so I, I reread that book probably once every two or three years because I just think the way it's written is so incredible. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, after this, I'm definitely going to go look up and try to buy those George Halbert direct response letters. I have- Gary uh, Halbert. Gary Halbert. Sorry, Gary Halbert. Thank you. That, that's obviously going to be helpful. I have at home, you know, a massive reference library for design stuff. And, and one of the favorite things, I have, I have a couple of things, but one of them is a book of all of the old VW ads from the 1950s and 60s, just because they had a run there. I think that was- a very unique moment in time in terms of advertising, but just the way that they brought together writing and visuals. I, I haven't seen anyone else do it outside of Apple. And Apple doesn't really do that anymore, but they used to be very playful with cop the interaction of kind of copy and design. And then the other one is I have a book of 1950s ads that's part cringeworthy because obviously everything has changed in terms of how we view roles and society and work and all of that. But uh, it's just a really cool moment in time. I really like that style. Um, anyways, so I love, I love those answers. There's a bunch, yeah, on that note, the the Ogilvy on advertising is a bit similar. Yes. And that's yes. a great I'm I'm a huge believer in going back and studying the old stuff. Even well, I just think it's it's uh I, yeah, for me, I guess the way I think about it is it just is flexing different. Uh, well, one, it opens up your mind into different ways that you can execute an idea, which is really powerful because no matter what you do, whether you're a writer or designer, working that part of your brain of how do you get out of what you're comfortable with and shake up your style a little bit and challenge yourself is really important. But then the other one is just, I th yeah, to, to your point, there are certain people that have mastered a medium and it pays huge dividends to go back and just look at what they've done and, and just take it in. And you, you might not, you know, I think one of the beliefs I have is that everything's connected. So I'm sure for some people listening, they might think, oh, Gary Halpert, how's it going to connect to the tweets that I want to write or the threads oh, that I want to write? No. It'll, it'll happen. <laughs> it'll happen. It all connects. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's some gems 
hidden in that stuff. I mean, there's a reason why all the best sales copywriters go study all the guys that were crushing it, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. I want to switch up and ask a very different question. Um, if people listening could shadow you for a day, so be with you from the time you wake up all the way until when you go to sleep, you know, setting aside, that'd probably be a little bit creepy. What do you think they would be most surprised by? And what I'm trying to get at there is like, is there anything about your, your habits, your routine, the way that you work, the way that you do different things during the day that might surprise people listening? I'll give you two, two answers. One, I, I think... In a very genuine way, I think most people would, I think they'd be pretty bored, to be honest. They'd, they'd be shocked at how much I just sit and write. Like today is a perfect example. You know, I knew we had this at 4 p.m. my time. I am not exaggerating. Aside to get up and grab my lunch, I've sat here and written since 8 a.m. I mean, that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. It's an amazing thing. I mean, I remember when I was younger and I would think about what it would be like to be a full-time writer. And somehow you romanticize this thing where somehow you're writing a lot and yet your your life isn't boring and you're not sitting down and writing at the same time, you know? And it hasn't been until the past few years where obviously this is my whole life and my livelihood and that it's kind of from the outside, it's kind of boring. Like I'm just sitting here writing. I'll, I'll, I'll say the more unconventional answer is I used to be a pro gamer as a teenager. I played World of Warcraft uh, professionally. And an interesting quirk that I can't seem to let go of is I still will have old uh, World of Warcraft videos like playing on YouTube in the background. And I don't know why, but there's something very calming and soothing about that. I think it just reminds me of being a kid. It just makes me feel like I'm you know, a kid. So if someone was watching me, they'd see me like tab back and forth between writing and these like 2008, like gaming. I mean, that's definitely surprising. You that know, checks the box. Yeah. And so I feel like that's a good, genuine, honest answer to that question. No, I love it. I want to ask one follow-up question, you know, in terms of, so you, you know, days like today, you sit down to write. I, I was listening to a book recently. Uh, Stephen Pressfield has a book. I forget one of, he has many, you won't be wrong by just looking up his name and ordering any one of his books, but there's one book in particular, and he's talking about creativity and uh, he talks about some, you know, when he stops for the day and he quotes other writers and some writers say to stop when you start making mistakes. Some writers say to stop when you know what's going to happen next. Some writers say to kind of leave something in the well for tomorrow. Do you have any approach to when you decide to stop working in a given day? I stop when my fiance says it's time to stop. That's, that's, <laughs> says, the, that's the answer the right there. It's time for dinner. You need to stop. Um, I mean, you know, I, it's funny cause I've read a lot of that same advice. Like I've tried the, the Hemingway, you know, stop in the middle of a sentence. There was a, there was probably a year or two where I took that extremely seriously. And I would literally force myself to stop in the middle of a sentence thinking that was like, going to guarantee that, you know, that was the magic. In general, I would say a, a rule I try to live by is if you can feel that you're flowing on an idea, try and not disrupt that, you know, put, push it as far. And, and usually you can feel when you're like, all right, I've gotten what I need to get out. I can pick this up tomorrow. But I, I've learned that it's a pretty big mistake. If I really connect with an idea, I start and then I just stop. Like the next day, it's not the same. Yeah. So well said. Um, I want to ask one other question around uh, kind of your skills and talents. And the way I typically ask this is, is to, you know, for, have you think of areas where you have an edge or a superpower? And superpower might seem like a super loaded term. You know, we've spent a bit of time talking. I think you actually have a lot of strengths that are, are pretty unique. When you think about your superpowers or areas where you have an edge, what comes to mind? And then how does that show up in your day-to-day -day life and work? I will definitely say, I think the biggest one is my ability to endure very boring things if it means having some sort of advantage. I've never thought of myself as a naturally talented writer. I mean, there were a lot of teachers in school that told me like, this is not the path for you. But the one thing that I know that I have is I am willing to sit there and endure it for way longer than the average person. You know, And I think that comes from uh, my years as a gamer. You know, I would just sit in front of my computer and grind and grind and grind and whatever, whatever I had to do, you know? So I think the endurance is a big piece. And in the past few years, I've really realized that I am very good at understanding how things are assembled. Again, I think it goes back to gaming. It's my recent fascination with templates. I can look at something and understand how it needs to be built. I might not 
be the most eloquent at it, or it might take me longer to develop that part of it. But the building, the asse- how things get assembled, I think is a big reason why I've been able to write and publish as much as I have. Yeah, those are super interesting. I want to switch uh, tax here a little bit. You know, you're a prolific writer. You're the author of uh, Snow Leopard, How Legendary Writers Create a Category of One, uh, which just came out. I highly recommend everyone listening uh, pick up. We're about to do a long form interview all about that book. Um, So I want to ask a couple of questions around writing and where I wanted to start. And I'm sure this is a question that will probably bore you as soon as it comes out of my mouth is writing process. You've talked a little bit about just this act of, you know, well, one, if there is flow, making sure that you take advantage of that and don't stop for any other reason if you don't have to. And then two, just this ability to sit and write and do, you know, endure. How else, if you can describe for people, is there anything else that's unique that might be applicable for others that other people can learn about your writing process? Or is there anything that you've learned? It's maybe another question. Yeah. I mean, it's hard because it's such a loaded question. There's so many parts that go into it. The simplified version that, that I've been thinking about a lot lately is this idea of First, do you know what you should be focusing on? So there's there's kind of multiple pieces here, and I'll walk through each one. So most people go, I don't know what I should be doing. I don't know what I should be doing. So so they can't take action because they don't they don't know, right? The the second layer is you go, I know what I should be doing, but I'm choosing not to. And then there's a whole bunch of beliefs and things you got to unpack when you get there, you know. And then the third layer is, I know what I should be doing and I'm doing it. So you're you're at least taking the action, you know, but you might not be doing it as well as you could. So you have more to learn on the execution side. And then there's the, I know what I should be doing and I'm doing it as best as I can. And so all you can do is wait for time to catch up, you know? And so in terms of writing process, to me, it starts with where are you in those four levels, you know, and depending on where you are, you're going to focus on very different things opposed to the average person just goes, you know, well, what do I, what do I need to do to just become a great writer? It's like, well, step one, are you even doing it every day? If you're not doing it every day, you have a habit problem to solve first, rather than we, we can't really get into the headlines and all the you know, nitty gritty stuff, you know, versus someone who goes, I'm doing it every day. And I'm blocking the 90 minutes, but I need some help understanding how do I spend those 90 minutes more intentionally, you know? So I think that's like an easy answer. I don't know if it's the most satisfying answer, but I think that focusing more on where are you in the process and are you actually doing it? If you're not doing it consistently, there's no point talking about anything else. Yeah. No, I think it's, I think it's very well said. And I think that framework of stages makes sense. And it, you know, it checks out in my own experience as well, too. One of the things that I always try to uncover is tools. And, you know, for a lot of people, it's just like, well, I'll just use the same average tools. But I wanted to ask you what tools you use, because one, you're a prolific writer. You also do a lot of publishing, obviously, of books on, on Twitter, um, over email, a bunch of different mediums. Are there any tools that you really lean on uh, or, or just tools that you really enjoy using? And that could be pieces of software. It could be a favorite notebook brand. It could be a pen. It could be anything. What comes to mind? I mean, once again, shameless plug for my own software tool because templates are great. To be honest, I'm I'm really not a big tool person. I'm not like a productivity app person or anything. I use the notes feature on my MacBook and on my phone, and I just I have a couple notes that are like book ideas, article ideas, Twitter thread ideas, and I just dump stuff in there. One tool that I, it took me a long time to find, and I had been looking for it for years, and I noticed not too many other writers know about it, is uh, there's a site called Readsy, R-E-E-D-S-Y.com. And it's a, I think primarily it's a marketplace that matches writers with editors. And, you know, it's, it's almost like a writer specific Upwork type situation, but they have a tool that's free there that is a text editor that you can export the text as Kindle files to upload to Amazon. And that feature, which sounds really simple, is not simple. And for years, what I would have to do is I would have to go find an editor because I didn't want to learn how to do it myself. So I would go find an editor and I would pay them whatever their rate was to take the Word document 
and put it into the formatted file for Kindle. And when I found Reedsy, Reedsy, I feel like I'm doing the video pitch right now. And when I found Reedsy, everything changed, you know, and it was, it, I still use it every week now for Category Pirates, which is the paid newsletter. I have with two other guys, the three of us authored Snow Leopard. Every week we publish a mini book and I use Reedsy to convert the, the Word doc into a Kindle file and upload it to Amazon. That's how we're able to publish so many mini books. So there's the whole process if anyone's listening that wants to go use it. I mean, that's fascinating. And I imagine a lot of people might also be interested. Uh, if anyone listening is a writer, I mean, I think an Upwork for writers sounds super interesting. So I'm definitely going to go check out the site. I want to ask one more loaded question. Uh, don't hate me. And this one is about your philosophy of writing. You know, one of the things you've clearly spent an enormous amount of time on, I, I assume you think of it as an infinite game, is just getting better at writing, you know, finding your voice, developing your voice and continuing to push forward with that. So the question I want to ask is if someone, you know, pointed a gun to your head and said, distill down your thoughts about what makes good writing into just a few words or just a few sentences or just a few bullets, what comes to mind? And these can be just a couple of principles. This can be an acid test for good writing versus bad writing. How do you think about your philosophy of good writing? This is something that has taken me a really long time to understand. But again, once it flipped for me, now there's no going back. Good writing changes the reader. And I think one of the most misunderstood parts of writing is, I remember when I was a kid and I wanted to grow up and be a writer, you know, is thinking that it's about you. Thinking that being a great writer is the you show and it's all about how good you write, you know, and the, the it's almost like the whole focus is just pointed back at yourself. And it takes you a really long time to realize that great writing has very little to do with you. It will change you in the process. It can be about you, your yourself and your heart and your story and everything can be in it, but it is ultimately about the reader. And so it's a, it's almost like you have to go through this process of retraining yourself to go, okay, pretend for a second you're not writing. You walk up to some random person on the street, you know, and you ask them questions and you go, what are you struggling with? And then they have something that they're struggling with that you have an answer to and you start explaining it to them. You know, it's not about you. It's about you wanting to help that person. And so writing is just the mechanism for scaling that interaction. That's it. You know, and even people that write memoirs about their own lives or or people that write science fiction or mysteries or stories or whatever, ultimately the reason we love those stories is because they're archetypal of ourselves right? We see ourselves in them. And so, yeah, my whole philosophy now is very, very over-rotated on understanding the reader. If you don't know who you're writing for, then your writing is not for anyone. And if your writing is not for anyone, then it's a journal. And if it's a journal, then don't be frustrated when readers go, I'm not paying attention to that because it's all about you. You know, that's a hard pill to swallow. No, it's a really hard pill to swallow. I think especially for most people uh, today. I want to ask two uh, simple closing questions. The first one is if you can share a tiny habit or practice that has had the biggest positive impact on your life or your work. I mean, I'm going to give the most cliche answer ever here, but writing, writing, and not just writing, but writing and hitting publish on the internet. My entire life changed. I was 23 years old living in a very small apartment with no air conditioning in Chicago. And I wanted to be a writer, had no idea how. And I challenged myself to write one Quora answer every single day for a year straight. And publishing something, not just writing and hiding it away in my apartment, but publishing something accelerated my learning process. It allowed me to gather feedback from readers, which is the point that I was just making. It allowed me to see my work outside myself, which forced me to learn in a different way. It allowed people to get a sense of what I was writing earlier, right? I didn't have to reveal some big grand opus project. So I can literally trace every single major milestone in my life over the past 10 years back to that decision. It's a great answer. Just, it sounds like, you know, that the, the takeaway there is just committing to an act of discipline in an area where you want to get better is extremely powerful <laughs> and just doing it, even if you have to stumble through it. An act of discipline. And I would, I would even say an act of discipline that you can do in public, 
there's something different about practicing in public. Real small tangent. It's it's the same story of I forget which Malcolm Gladwell book he put this in, but it was it's the Beatles story. Most people don't know that before they got signed, you know, for 10 years, they would play in clubs for seven hours a day. And a lot of their songs they wrote as they were just riffing in these clubs, filling time. And so by the time they got their record deal, they already had 10,000 hours of practice, you know, but the reason that that practice is so valuable is because it was in front of other people giving you feedback. Oh, you like this riff. Oh, you don't like this riff, you know? So I feel like it's the same with the gym, right? There's a totally different experience if you're exercising with or in front of other people versus completely by yourself at your house. So yeah, daily discipline multiplied by in public is exponential result. Yeah. Discipline plus feedback loop. So you can actually tell <laughs> if you're making progress and exactly. you get that prop likely brutal, you know, feedback uh, loop. But it accelerates it, right? That's no, the whole no, no, no. It's extreme. It's extremely powerful. It's extremely powerful. I mean, it goes back to a principle that I always love and think about, which is just skin in the game, you know, making sure that, uh, yeah, for those things that you're putting yourself out there, because that's the only way you're going to learn and be able to get better. Last question. If you could go back to the start of your career, uh, is there any advice, words of wisdom, reminders that you would whisper in your ear? I'm starting to sound like an old person when I say this, but I just wish I just wish I would have known a lot of the things that I knew now back then. You know, I wish I would have started earlier, even though I started as a teenager writing and all these things, but I just I wish I would have started earlier. I wish I would have not overthought it all so much. Like the number of times I would start, stop, restart, you know, I just I was so obsessed with thinking I had to have it all figured out before I went on the journey. And now I've just completely let go of that. I'm like, all right, I'm going to write this thing and whatever. I'll feedback loop. I'll put it out into the world and I'll see what happens versus overthinking it for nine months. And then, well, or just keeping it in that notes app. And it's yeah. just something there that you stare at day after day after day after day. Yeah. Wasted a lot of time doing that. Yeah. Well, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for joining me, Nicholas Cole. This has been great. Thanks.